this is actually just an advertisement, an advertising <laughs> session for the film festival that's being co-sponsored by the Alumni Engagement Committee and uh, Nursing Research Ups. So first of all, I just wanted to acknowledge my amazing team. Um, this is this is representing many many years, a couple of decades of very hard work, and so um, Annette Brown co-led this with me, and Marilyn Ford Gilbo from Western. We had a, a wonderful uh, steering committee of Indigenous women. I'll tell you a little bit more. Uh, you all know Vicky Bunky and, and Vicky Sly, who were at least on the team, and, and uh, Kushambi. Many of you know. Uh, it's been our long-term research manager. So I just wanted to acknowledge our, our team. This is uh, based on research that we've done across Canada, typically New Brunswick, Ontario, and BC. We, we've had those sites in all of our studies. So um, we've been working on the area of violence against women for quite a while across this team. And um, of course, at the same time, um, I and Annette in particular have been doing research in Indigenous communities. So we know that it doesn't matter what, how you, what the focus of the study is, Indigenous women experience about four to eight times the burden and the, the levels of violence that non-Indigenous women do. So uh, four times more likely to be killed by a partner, um, much higher levels of injury rate, um, much higher levels of incidence. So it really doesn't matter how you study it. Um, Four, uh, about four to eight times the, the burden. Um, and it's not just that women experience much higher levels of violence, but that that's coupled with uh, challenges getting housing, getting jobs, and so on, you know, because of, the, because of the extensive racism that they face on a daily basis. So we've been working on um, uh, an intervention to help women who have abusive partners regain their health. So it's a, we, uh, my colleagues have done grounded theory study around how do women do that after they've left abusive partners. And um, what, we, what we found is women are coping with all what we call intrusions. So these areas of problem that would be the obvious things, which is abuse is often ongoing and often escalates after a woman leaves her partner. And many of you already know that. Uh, what's less um, obvious, perhaps, are the fact, is the fact that you're always contending with uh, life changes that you didn't want and didn't anticipate. Either you have to move or you lose your partner's in, um, income or custody of your children becomes contentious, all these kinds of changes. Um, and that getting help is often very costly, not just financial terms, but in terms of the risk of judgment or, you know, um, if you uh, indicate that your children are, have been exposed to violence that's considered, often considered child maltreatment and your children might be apprehended. So there's a lot of risks and costs to getting help. And then there's the ongoing health effects of violence, which physical and mental and emotional health effects last for a very long time, even after women have left their partners. And we've done longitudinal research looking at that. So, for example, chronic pain is very high as a consequence of living in stressful conditions over a long period of time, and that does not go away um, and doesn't even, in fact, decline below symptomatic uh, without any kind of intervention. So we, we studied women's experiences, and we found that they, they worked in kind of these six areas, promoting their own safety, getting basic things like energy, housing, food, clothing, and so on, um, managing these symptoms, um, sort of reconfiguring what does it mean to be a family in the aftermath of violence, um, focusing hopefully on themselves, which women tend not to do a very good job of, especially when there's children, and then reconnecting with people, um, and that could be new partners or it could be uh, friends and so on, in a new way, in a way that's not going to um, um, put them at further risk of violence. So we created this intervention, we trialed it in a couple of places, and we had very good results on our feasibility studies. But <coughs> we didn't know whether or not that would be uh, applicable to ind Indigenous women. And um, we, we were, I, was, I was in particular really concerned about the idea of taking uh, health promotion intervention that we uh, tested with non-Indigenous women and just applying it. So we tried to be really cautious about our approach. Hi, Judy. Thank you for coming. Um, so what we did was we, we 
engaged in a pretty long process. And the first thing that we did was we, uh, we interviewed elders. And we were working primarily in the downtown east side. We partnered initially with Vancouver Native Health. And that's where the idea came from. And they were trying to strengthen the, their programming for women and make it more accessible. And uh, so we started interviewing Indigenous elders kind of at Vancouver Native Health, and then we worked our way out in a big circle asking for advice. What should this look like? How could it be useful? Could it be useful? And so on. We also used Cree, and I'll give you a little bit of an example of that, to get out of the, the kind of the confines of only working in English um, or working with Indigenous women whose, you know, languages have been systematically eroded. And so this, that was kind of an important, not just from a symbolic point of view, but a conceptual point of view. We pilot tested it with 21 women um, at Vancouver Native Health, and then uh, we, we revised it, and 152 women, um, we tested it in two cohorts. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Oops, sorry. Um, this is just to give you a sense of what I mean by using Cree concepts. So Madeline Dion Stout, who is a Cree speaker and one of our uh, advisors, then took a series of concepts and um, worked them through in Cree. And I'm going to give you one example. Um, and I, I, I'm trying to say Kedemikskoma, which is poverty in Cree. When we say poverty in English, we kind of tend to mean economic poverty, um, economic disadvantage. When you say poverty in Cree, you mean the, the sort of the multiple intersecting spiritual, mental, emotional, as, and physical poverties that are, are all interconnected. So it's the weight of, of um, being of impoverishment and spiritual impoverishment and so on, all combined. And that's more what we were trying to tackle than strictly economic deprivation. So the revised intervention looked like the original one in that nurses met one-to-one -one with women, uh, but we additionally had an elder-led circle. And the nurses participated in that, and they would workshop things in that circle. So for example, if we were doing managing symptoms, the nurses would do a workshop on how to manage your chronic pain, non-pharmacological non approaches to managing pain. Uh, and the elder would do um, traditional teaching that would go along with whatever that theme was. So that's kind of what it looked like. And we had 150, now look, you want you to notice these numbers, 152 women in the, in the big study signed up, but only 112 of them participated. And that was due to a lot of big challenges, ethical challenges that we, that we ran into in part. Um, and then uh, 89 women really actively participated. So it sounds bad, but actually in, if you know this, the context that we were working in, we were actually very pleased with ourselves. So, um, it's taking me a lot to explain to editors that this is actually pretty significant that we manage. So I don't know how well you can see this, but um, the 152 women, 40 of them left after the initial interview. And part of that is due to the, the context that we were practicing in. You know, there's extreme poverty. People, the majority of the women were in social assistance, some of them on disability, and people would come for an interview because there was an honorarium, quite frankly. And, uh, and it, we, we really had to be very, very careful about how we did it. So we accepted people. And we would give them an honorarium and then say, thank you, that's great. Uh, you don't need to answer any of our questions, um, which created more of an interest, perhaps. But um, none of the women didn't stay for their interview. Um, so that actually, in fact, created problems because we were asking very difficult questions about their histories and their experiences and so on. So we ended up turning people out onto the street, having traumatized them, and then they weren't really interested in participating. So we had to really shift how we were doing that to try to uh, limit that. So um, of the women who did actively participate, the 89, um, they, they had, um, on average, about 10 meetings with their nurses. They spent about an average of 33 hours in the intervention, and um, the, um, of that, some of, uh, they, they, some of them participated in the circles. Some just met with their nurse, some participated in both. Um, and uh, yeah, so a little bit less participation with nurses than in our other studies, uh, but 
overall more time because they participated in these group circles. So I'm going to show you about a four-minute clip out of the video, and I'm trying to entice you to come to the film festival. But I also wanted you to just think as you're watching it, what, what is it that you think it was challenging the nurses, and what did the women value? So escape, she says, and then just push on this button. Okay. It actually evolved a little when throughout the study. Um, I remember initially I was really, I was so worried about, you know, doing it <laughs> exactly as it was laid out. Um, you know, making sure like all the components were equally covered or, uh, but that I threw that out the window after maybe the first couple of meetings. Um, and uh, really supported the women to lead what was important to them. And um, even then, even when it was led, uh, sometimes we just had to take a break um, where we just have a casual conversation about what's going on in life and stuff because uh, the things that we were working on were just too much. Luckily today, we can name PTSD and we can understand women living with violence from their intimate partners, which then becomes manifests itself in, in um, um, chronic health problems, sadness, depression. I really enjoyed the fact that you can really kind of contact the nurse um, kind of almost any time about anything, just even just to go out for coffee and share some laughs or just really get down to business. I mean, whether it was looking for a house for me or getting me a new doctor that would listen to my interests. My nurse Nellie through the program was amazing. She was always there available at any time for any kind of support to answer any kind of questions. She was a great help with trying to pull me through to other doctors and specialists for my condition. It depends on the person, it depends on, on uh, what's happening for them. Um, you really need to be flexible, like I've gone on tours of the downtown east side through like pubs and you know, and we're talking the whole time and but but it's it's uh, that's kind of where that person is at and whether they're feeling anxious and need to move, that's fine. Or, you know, I've had meetings in, in the park, in, in a participant's home. Like, it really varies where where they're at. I was really when we go have coffee or skip my place. Um, I was able just to be me, just to be relaxed and just tell her everything. You know, tell her everything. She seemed like tears. And, um, it's, and, and you know what I learned that, um, no matter who you're with, sometimes you could teach them something as well. It's not only them that they could teach you, you could teach them something as well. When they introduced the one-to-one, -one, I was like, yeah, this is what I need. This is where I wanted to do. This is what I wanted to do. So it all fits like a puzzle, like the cultural stuff. You know, I'm making like medicine baskets and I make it all together like little pieces and it all came together like the medicine wheel if there was yeah so were you struck by anything nothing yeah judy well for me and um, this reaffirms things that we've seen is that that opportunity or the, the permission that the clinician has to sort of move with and engage with the person on their own terms. Like we have so many rules about where, when, how, what, you know, what, you know, what is it we do and you know, we, we, we put ourselves in boxes unnecessarily and we can hear from what these women are saying. A, they have something to teach us and B, just being there with someone as a, a knowledgeable mentor partner is an intervention. Like it did something for these women. And I think we can all start talking what we want to do something, but you know, 
that to me is the permission piece that we rarely give ourselves. Thank, Thank you. Say more. Well, <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else want to come in? The women value the availability <laughs> and value the availability of the nurses that call whenever you can be with me in whatever moment and that the women were allowed to be authentic. I think that's that's echoing what Judy was saying, that authenticity. Right. Yeah. And you know, I don't know what, what impression you would have about how much the nurses were available. But you know, both those women are like, I could just call her anytime. Well actually that wasn't the case. They knew that they were only only could have access to the women, the, the nurses between about ten and five. That that was it, and that was the only times at which the nurses would return the text or phone call. And they met with them once a week. But the impression was that they were available all the time. It was it was quite it was quite remarkable. Yeah. Could you think a little bit more about the nurses? Because the I mean they seem really amazing. And so you couldn't well, get knowledge nurses for that. How do you how do we get to the point where right. how do you train nurses to be that way? Right. Well, we had a lot of problems. We actually had. Well, let, let me just say I got to know HR really well at this university. Um, we we had difficulty hiring, and we had difficulty with training, and. Um, uh, you know, the, the nurses, they were amazing, but it was really super hard, really challenging. It was difficult to get the right nurses in the first place. And we additionally have a layer of, understandably, everybody wanted us to hire Indigenous nurses. But you can't, the hard lesson is you can't hire somebody because they're Indigenous, especially if they don't have the skills. So we learned some really, really hard lessons. Um, and some of our nurses were novices, and so that it didn't work very well. So ideally, we need people who are, um, or just say, I don't know what I'd say, politically and philosophically on board. Um, with, in fact, what Judy was mentioning, uh, an orientation to have the women lead uh, was really important. Um, ideally, I think some community health background would be helpful. So yeah, that. I'll, I will, I'll sh I'm going to show you some stuff and then say more about that, actually. Elizabeth? Um, how did you deal with, or, or did it come up, um, you talk about novice nurses, but what about um, working with nurses, and, and I think this may be one of the sort of the, the challenges around um, hiring within the community, people who've had their own experiences around violence, mm -hmm. um, and, and that potential for vicarious trauma or re-trauma? Right. Um, yes. Uh, fortunately for us, in this particular situation, the nurses were pretty mature around their own experiences of violence. So that, um, what was more difficult, I think, was the elders. Um, because then they ended up, and we made a lot of mistakes, and I'll, I'll show you a bit of the mistakes. Um, in this idea of a circle, then uh, both nurses and elders were, and women themselves were listening to, and we, we weren't trying to get people to share their trauma experiences, but in, inevitably those came out. And so it was, I think, super hard for the elders because they were simultaneously had, had huge experiences themselves, and then they were list, not only listening, but responsible for having you know, sort of controlling the impact or trying to limit the impact of that. So it was a huge man, and then I came in a bit late, but I, I liked the um, mention that in, in addition to the participants learning from the nurses, the nurses were learning from the participants. Yeah. The reciprocal yeah. thing. And what did you do to cultivate that, or was it um, one of your learnings? Yeah, we, I mean, we did try at the outset to do that. I think, though, we, we, we ended up really being very explicit. We have funding now to do an RCT, not, of, not for Indigenous women specifically, but more generally. And, but the commitment is to make it appropriate for Indigenous women everywhere. Um, and um, one of the things that we've done, and it sound, might sound minor, but when we started this project, we talked about a nurse-led 
intervention. Now we talk about a woman-led intervention. And we're really trying to be very explicit about that uh, because it uh, is very difficult for the nurses, no matter how oriented they are to this way of practicing, uh, even with community health experience, um, it was really difficult to get them out of the stance of being the expert. Yeah. And so I think we've got a long ways to go on that, but I think that there is, there are, for me, there are curricular implications from all of this, you know, for, for our undergraduate and um, training and for just training for this kind of practice. So I just want to say a little bit more and then we'll go back to the, the, the dialogue. I want, just want to have an opportunity to show you findings. Um, and so as you've already seen from the film and you've already started dialoguing about uh, the women, the, the nurses had difficulty with the fact that we were not asking them to do uh, a very structured job. Uh, and they felt uncomfortable. All of their interviews, they talked about uh, being paid to have coffee and being uncomfortable with that. They didn't really, they knew it was nursing work, but they didn't really feel fully comfortable with it. And the, uh, one of the other things is they kept talking about counseling, not having the counseling skills, and how the women needed more counseling. And they felt inadequate to that task. And so these two nurses in particular, um, they were, they had 30 some years of experience working in the downtown east side, but they worked as home care nurses. And it was quite interesting because they were very frustrated with health authority increasingly narrowing their scope. You can only visit if you have a dressing change to do or a medication to give or a, you know, there had to be a task for them to justify a visit. And in our case, there was no there was no task. There was no justification needed. Just meet the woman, follow their lead, see how you can promote their health. So they, the nurses were also really, um, even though they some of them had been working in these areas for a long time, when they were so really directly confronted with the circumstances of the women's lives, it was really hard. And uh, they, they, you know, they feel, felt like they were taking, you know, one step forward, two steps back. And, you know, joining women in that difficult circle of trying to get ID, they can't get ID, they can't get this kind of a service because they don't have an address, they can't get an address because they don't have ID, they can't get a birth certificate because they don't, they were in foster care so many times, people have lost track. You know, this Nazi cuckoo uh, cycle that people got caught in was very, very frustrating. And the abject poverty people were living in. Um, was, was very, came really in the nurses' faces and really made it difficult. Um, the nurses, I think, were looking for structure. And you heard Greta, the one nurse, saying, um, trying to make sure the, cover, the components were covered equally. Now, we never, ever, in a million years, said do that. We said, please have a conversation about each of these areas with the women and then set priorities. Have a conversation about each area but not, not equally. We never said that. We said focus on what's of importance to her. If helping her get the house, housing is the starting point you need to get done before you even talk about pain or anxiety or panic attacks or whatever, then do that. But somehow the structure was just so ingrained in how we train nurses and how we do the work um, that it was very, very difficult for, for the nurses to really feel comfortable about what they were doing and hence, to be able to explain to the women what was available. So um, to the contrary, in contrast, what the women said, and you could already hear echoes of this in the, in the video, the women really valued going for coffee. And it wasn't the coffee, although this woman say that may not be the coffee or the donut, but your company and stuff is the big thing. So the coffee was a reason to go, a non-stigmatizing reason to have a meeting with a healthcare provider, okay? I don't have to go into the HIV clinic. I don't have to go into somewhere where I'm labeled as a whatever. I'm just having coffee. And yet, it's all about me. And that was invaluable to the women. And they say it over and over and over again in their interviews. And, um, you know, and, you know, they, and being able to talk to her about anything and not be rushed. And that was one thing that the women kept commenting on is having what felt like to them endless time. Now, the nurses were on a schedule. They would only meet with them for an hour. But the women felt like time was taken and time was available. Um, 
and it was often in contrast to their um, meetings with primary care providers where they really felt rushed and they had to stick to one problem and those kinds of things that you're familiar with. So the women felt that the big impacts were around opening up. And opening up wasn't filling your guts with kind of opening up. It was opening up and up opening up enough to trust to say what they were worried about or say what they were feeling or concerned about or what they wanted. Um, so opening up was the big thing and, and trusting. And a lot of the women talked about um, having previously always felt that they were in competition with other women and not trusting other women whatsoever. And so this was a, a quite a significant experience for many of the women was that opportunity to engage with other women in a, in a positive, supportive, meaningful way. And the trust, confidence, and opening up that the women talked about extended beyond just working with the nurse or even their engagement with, the, with other women. They talked about um, being able to talk to their doctors more effectively or talk to other providers or other people in their lives um, to feel that they could more stand up. So, this woman says, I feel much more confident to speak to people in authority. And if you have a sense of the history of Indigenous people, um, you know that that's pretty much been beaten out of people. So for people to be able to, um, what some women talk about, standing up for myself, um, and this woman, says, she goes on to say, I feel like I'm more open now, like with my doctors, my nurses, and stuff like that. So they were finding that their care was more effective with other providers as well based on their relationship with their, with their nurse and elder. And so uh, one of the things that struck us was the ways in which the women talked about their ability to benefit from other forms of social support. And this woman says, I'm better able to start friendships now. That's always been a problem. Even if I can start a friendship, I can't maintain it always. I feel I've grown a lot in that way. It's easier for me now. I feel I've learned more social skills. So they, they talked a lot about how they were doing better in their lives, just more generally. Now, as I sort of suggested to you, we had a lot of problems, and these are just some of the major things that didn't work very well. Um, first of all, we had mismatches. The women didn't always like their nurses. Um, they didn't always like the elder. They didn't always respect the elder. They felt the elder was too cultural or not cultural enough or didn't know how to handle circles or whatever. So the women had uh, disagreements uh, with each other. One woman beat up the other woman's boyfriend. Like we had like serious stuff going on all the time. Um, and there was a lot of tension in the group setting. Um, women who were substance using or talking about substance use were um, problematic for women who were trying to cut down on their use. We didn't start out with any goals around the women's substance use. We, we asked, do you think you have a, a substance use problem? And over 50% of them thought they did. Um, but we, that wasn't our business to tell them what to do, but maybe not surprisingly, most of the women uh, cut down on their drinking. Many went, went into treatment, uh, went into detox, um, so it really was very effective under their own terms, um, under their own kind of pressure. <laughs> the other thing that was very disappointing was um, that the women didn't really uh, grasp what they were, what to expect out of it. and. But at even, even the final interviews, although we got better and better and better at doing it, some of the women didn't really know what they could have accessed from the nurse or what to expect and so on. So that was some of our, some of our problems. So the good news is that it really worked. Now, this analysis that I'm showing you is based on all 152 women. We had to put, for this kind of an analysis, we had to put everybody in. So remember, that includes 40 women who did an initial interview and then didn't engage with us, and then a whole whack of women that came once to a circle, saw what it was about, and went away. We still collected data on those women, and we still put them into the mix. Even so, you see that for quality of life, PTSD symptoms, depressive symptoms, social support, their sense of mastery or control of their lives, their sense of personal agency, all of those things increased and, and stayed maintained, the increases were maintained at six months. So that's all very good news. And it's not as strong as our feasibility studies in, these, in uh, New Brunswick and Ontario in terms of the, the, you know, the effect size wouldn't be as big, but 
um, we have a, a much water get more watered down sample. And I'm quite fond of saying that if this was a drug, Pfizer would have it on the market. And this is this is nurses having coffee. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the power of, of nurses being able to listen to a, a person and support their health. Uh, I personally think it's quite amazing. I, um, the interpersonal agency was not sustained. It improved a little bit. It's not a huge improvement, but it didn't say sustained. And I think that's understandable Inter by interpersonal agency, meaning the extent to which you feel you have some control over the things that the people in your lives do that, that affect you. Um, and the, the thing that we are unable, and again, we were not surprised about this, pain disability didn't change. And we uh, treated that as a secondary outcome. And, and uh, <coughs> we've had remarkably little success in being able to improve people's uh, actual pain or their pain disability. So um, the women uh, really felt they wanted more. Uh, they wanted more, longer. They wanted a permanent program. Um, they thought the nurses needed to know more about substance use. And so back to your question about who we hired, and how, we did not adequately train them. And um, they didn't come with adequate knowledge. And even though Vicki Bunke gave them session after session after session, it wasn't sufficient to really um, work in a context where the women knew a lot about substance use. And uh, the nurses were very much remained novice. So we're trying to do something about that. Um, and, and the, the aspect of the cultural teachings, some women were very drawn to the cultural teachings, uh, some women not so much, some women wanted more, some less. So there, there was no kind of consensus on that. Um, we got very clear that what we needed to do was be much uh, more overt. In, say, we, we needed to give women a menu of here's what it is and here's your options. More than 50% of the women had had significant head injuries in their lives. So they, they had, never mind substance use, they had really very, very big challenges with memory problems. And so they, you know, getting them there to, their, to the circle or remembering their appointments was very difficult and quite challenging for the nurses. Um, so we, we could have done a lot more to support the women. Um, we, we need way more on um, pain management. The women were dealing with extremely high levels of pain. Um, so we, sh we could have done a lot more about that. And I think we needed, we had an intention of engaging at a more political level to make changes. And really that's where the, that's where the goal is. And so um, we need to put more effort into that. I mean, when, uh, even when we were able to get a, a woman from being on, on social assistance, first of all, from no income whatsoever, or from social assistance onto disability, it made such a huge difference in the quality of their, their lives, and yet we couldn't do anything about the housing situation, for example. So I think we, we as researchers, need to use this to promote um, more significant sort of social, social change. So um, we have, uh, we, as I said, we got funding to do an RCT of, of this thing, and we're Right, uh, right in the midst of revising as we go. Um, but I think that what we found is we, we are confident that this, a nursing intervention, and I, I'm a little reluctant to call it home visiting uh, program, because many of the women didn't have homes, and they, you know, uh, I, I actually, just a little aside, um, I go to this conference called the Nursing Network on Violence Against Women International, and I've been going for a couple of decades, and they were gonna do a big panel on home visiting. And so one of my colleagues said, oh, well, we should put this program into that. And um, they said, well, it's not, that's not home visiting. That's not home visiting because you meet your women in cafes and coffee shops. And I'm like, okay, well, because they don't have homes that are safe for us to go to, it can't be called a home visiting program. Like, okay. The class <laughs> bias was just very annoying to me. Sorry, a little rant. Um, you know, I think the women were super impressive. If you could just, if you could come and see the video, the full video, they're so amazing, and their their interviews uh, are really profound in terms of their commitment to wanting to improve their lives and do better in their lives. And it was just such a, you know, I think a breath of fresh air for them to not be judged and and yet be supported. And so they were the ones that said, yeah, I think I've got a substance use problem, and yes, I want help with it. There was none of that hopefully none of this going on. Um, 
So um, we we think that we could have done uh, a better a better job, but uh, some of the things that worked were that just that non-judgmental listening, um, unconditional positive regard, and really trying to work on the on the women's health and well-being for their perspective, and and sort of respecting their priorities in terms of uh, indigenous women. Um, I think really trying to put in the foreground that being an indigenous person is a strength was just so valued by the by the women. Um, you know, against the backdrop of of decades of mistreatment and racism that they encountered, which was remain their their biggest uh, their biggest challenge for sure. I haven't yet worked out the cost um, for this one. Uh, in the other two studies, the cost was about three thousand dollars per woman. So that's a fairly big cost. Um, to a system, um, but I, I, I have tried to argue that, that, that in fact it's cost efficient, um, that in the long run uh, the women have better lives, um, they use less services or they use the services they have um, more effectively. So I'll be working on that. So we have a publication on at least the pilot study. And if any of you are interested in it, I'm happy to send you the link. It's open access. And we would be so happy if you guys could come and see the full film at our film festival with many other excellent films. So, comments. <laughs>